Tonight on the season finale of The Henry Rollins Show, we welcome Matt Dillon, who is here to discuss his new film, Factotum, based on the writings of Charles Bukowski. And I'll join the original members of the Rollins Band for an exclusive musical performance that will end our season the only way I know how. Rockin'. Stay right here. Freedom is under attack, under attack by hysterical and well-funded Christian psychotics, intellectually undernourished leaders who lie and manipulate information, overfed baby Huey coward bitch motherfuckers like Karl Rove and their suck-up weakling apologists like Sean Hannity. To question authority is to be somehow unpatriotic, un-American, and in league with terrorists worldwide? Fuck you! With even election results becoming more and more questionable, the Constitution, a thing to be manipulated, ignored, and frivolously amended, even democracy itself seems to be on the run. So where's the one place you can go and tell your version of the truth, rail against liars, fakes and propagandists with your own unique propaganda, sign your name to it, and let the whole world know how you feel? That's right, the internet. Perhaps responsible for the most substantial shifts in culture in the last several decades. There's so much freedom and potential on the World Wide Web that one is barely able to get one's head around it. Who in their right mind would dare to regulate or charge websites to be on the internet? Who would dare to rain on a parade so fantastic that many of us would not know what to do without our high-speed connection and our lives on the internet? Actually, some very powerful forces. Telco companies want to make you pay for your site to be carried on the internet. If you can't afford to pay, guess what? That's right, your cyber history, pal. The Bush administration wants major internet and phone companies to keep track of where their customers surf, all in the name of the war on terror, don't you know? How much do you want to bet they want the internet regulated, contained, and thrown into a cell at Guantanamo Bay? For a country that talks so much about freedom being on the march, seems to me that some people want anything but. If they come for your freedom, you must not only resist, you must strike back with a vengeance that will stun them. On this front, if your anger and outrage are not at the forefront, then you're already dead. Dead to me, anyway. Fuck these cowards, these traitors, these enemies of democracy. Thanks for watching the show this season. Never relent. Joining me now is actor, writer, and director Matt Dillon, whose body of work reaches back to the classics like Rumblefish and up to last year's Oscar winner for Best Picture, Crash. Matt is starring the soon-to-be-released Factotum, playing Henry Chinovsky, the alter ego of novelist and poet Charles Bukowski. And he's been nice enough to come by for our final episode of the season. Matt, thanks for coming in. Good to be here. Yeah, very nice to have you here. So, um, tell us about Factotum. Well, I think it was Bukowski's second novel, you know. So it's about a guy who goes from job to job. He really can't hold down a job. You know, he just sort of works these dead-end jobs just to make enough money so he can, you know, you know, drink and write these poems, and nobody wants to buy the poems. And, uh, you know, for me, it came as a sort of a surprise when they, you know, approached me, you know, about playing, doing the film, and because I was a big Bukowski fan. Hadn't read this stuff for years, and, uh, you know, I never thought of myself as a physical type, although I'd read all the stuff. And, and, you know, it's one of those things, sort of like, it's sort of like when you hit 40 and you go, man, I'm not 40, you know? And it's sort of like, man, I'm not Bukowski. I'm not old enough to play Bukowski yet. And then they were like, hey, Matt, face the music, man. You're at that age, you know, you, could, you can start doing those sort of roles. But so it turned out to be a really a, a nice thing. So f for you, who is Bukowski? You know, when I see, how I see him now, interesting, you know, interestingly enough, I never thought of him as a guy 
who was employable, you know, like who, as a, a worker. And now, having done Factotum, I saw him as kind of a working class hero. Mm -hmm. You know, a guy who sort of becomes a voice for all those people who work those jobs. I mean, 95% of the people who, you know, are working, they're not necessarily happy doing what they're doing, you know. And sort of, so for him, I mean, he talks about those people in the bars that go to the bars after work, and that's sort of living the dream for them. Those two hours in the bar, or 12 hours in the bar, whatever it was after work was worth all the misery of that job and the hangover. And, uh, you know, so I kind of see him as a very sympathetic, uh, sort of a working class hero, you know. It's interesting. He knew what it was like to sleep in the, in the park benches, you know, and really be down and out and still have this humanity. I think that's why the work still works, why he has, you know, so many people still, mm. still key into what he's doing. Um, how do you personally relate to Bukowski? Well, you know, I, I benefited from, um, you know, at, in terms of playing him from a series of interviews that Barbe Schroeder did. I, I, didn't, I didn't take out Barfly. I mean, I, I loved it when I saw it years ago. I really did. I liked it as, a, as, as its own thing, you know. And, but he had done a series of interviews mm. that really, I benefited from that at night. I just watched those and sort of absorb him. And I mean, it's such a, so, you know, it's great when you can play somebody who really existed because, you, you know, there's such a, you know, a wealth of uh, source material. But on a, in terms of, it, you know, deciding to do the film, one of the things that the first thing I said was like, look, if you're looking for a Bukowski impersonation, you know, I can't do that, you know. Um, and, and, and they said, no, no, it's Henry Chinoski, it's the alter ego. You don't have to feel in any way that you have to do that. And I said, oh, okay, good. So that gave me the sense of relief, like there was some latitude mm. there. I don't have to become Charles Bukowski, right. which is kind of impossible. And, uh, but then, of course, I spoke to Linda Bukowski, mm. who was terrific, yeah. and she really helped me. I mean, we spoke, I was in Central Park, and we were on the phone, really. And I just started asking her questions, and that was really helpful to me. And one of the things she said, you know, was that, you know, there was one thing that really bothered Hank, was that, he was often depicted, or uh, there was this misconception about him that he was like dirty, that he was, a, that he was a slob, and it really bothered him, you know, because he wasn't. He was very, he was a neat guy, you know. He was clean, you know. He was disciplined, you know. He's a guy who gets up and he's, he he washes and he's not. And I think the obvious way to play a guy who's a you know a skid row alcoholic is to play him as kind of a. A slob, and I think to go against that, that was what that specific thing that she told me helped me so much with the dignity of the character. And, uh, you know, other than that, um, you know, just sort of let myself go. I didn't do one of those, I'm gonna put on, you know, 45 pounds, yeah. you know, I'm gonna get it exactly at 45 pounds, you know, which is, uh, you know, actually is dangerous for your health. Yeah. But I, uh, I thought a lot of it was more in the body language, you know, I never thought of Bukowski as a a fat guy, or and and I'd seen some early uh, early interviews with him, you know, uh, Bukowski at Bellevue. It was a piece. The guy had dark hair, you know. I mean, he he really looked like a product of the '50s, you know. And I'd always thought of him as a kind of dirty old man when I read him. I always, you know, that image of him, that image of the grizzled with the white hair, and. Uh, so, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, I spent a little time at the track. Of course, I lost, you know, I lost everything, man. I, I don't know how people do it. You really got to, you got to be committed to that lifestyle, you know. Um, but I didn't do, I didn't feel like I needed to get drunk, you know, every night, which is, I figured I got 20 years of that, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that, uh, like we were saying before, there is a lot of misconceptions uh, sometimes with, with him the, like the, the dirty part, like, you know, in the movie, he goes to the track, he has some luck, and what's the first thing he does with the money? He gets a suit. You know, that, that's a concern to, like, look presentable and just, like, have a pair of shoes that work instead of, like, well, now we're going to buy a whole bunch of booze. And, and it was never him partying. You know, you don't see him going to, you know, bars and, like, being the wild man. He's kind of a professional drinker, you know? Like, more of a maintenance guy, yeah. you know? He's not, you know, it's not like Arthur, you know? Stumbling yeah. around drunk, you know. Well, and also the work. He was so the central line of his life is you know all that work. And if you see the just the sheer amount of stuff that 
came out in his lifetime. And they keep finding, you know, they keep putting out more of these books of his, mm. of this writing. And even the posthumously released stuff is pretty damn good. It's prolific, you know, and I think he was disciplined. Yeah. You know, I, I'm convinced that the graveyards are filled with people who thought, you know, Charles Bukowski drank a case of beer a day. And look, he was a great writer. And, yeah. You know, look at Keith Richards, you know, yeah. William Burroughs, you Charlie know, Shot Parker. Dope, yeah. yeah. Well, Charlie Parker was a casualty, though, at an early age. But, but those guys lived on. Yeah. I mean, Bukowski lived to 73. You wouldn't right. think he would have had that long no, a run. No, you, you think the, the guts would have given out. But, like, with Parker, you know, he's played a good horn. But a lot of his friends thought it was the dope. So they said, I'll take the... He's like, no, 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 you, you, you want right, to right. practice. I practice. Don't don't think that this is the way to the the thing. Yeah, Bukowski had true talent, mm. and he showed up. Yeah, you know, and I think you know you can say that about you know. I think the mistake there's a lot of you know. Uh, Sam Shepard one time I was speaking to him, he called them fool killers. You know, guys that they they're living that lifestyle and they're the exception rather than right. the rule. And people say, hey, I can do that, and they they don't make it. Yeah, you, you have to wonder how many people Keith Richards killed by just being Keith Richards. You know, never met him, have no bad thoughts towards these people, and they went like, just like Keith. <laughs> uh, um, the thing that occurred to me when I saw Crash, it really hit me that I was like, fuck, this guy's got so much solid work behind him. And now, how do you feel when you see something like Rumblefish or The Outsiders getting like, you know, the, the major release on DVD and seen as like, you know, classic films? Mm. Those are beautiful movies. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, it's for me, I, I, I saw, you know, Rumblefish again recently and people would, oh, people say to me now, you know, you, you never age. And I, I saw that movie and I've aged, man, because oh. I remember feeling like, you know, I was a kid when I did those, but um, I think it's great because at the time when those films were made, it felt a little bit like some of the uh, critics and people were unfairly gunning for Francis because he was, he had just been, yeah. I think he had been too successful, you know. I mean, I think after, you know, what he had done, you know, with, you know, the Godfather movies and Apocalypse and the con conversation, I think they were sort of ready for him. Um, so, I mean, it's nice, you know, it's interesting when you go back and, like, the first film I did, Over the Edge, was never released. It was released, like, you know, four years after it was right. made. And and I just think they didn't know what to do with that film, you know? And they did, re oh, no, they did release it for about five, they released it for about five days. And, it, you know, it's a film, it's sort of a social commentary about kids and society in the suburbs. And, and uh, they turned it into, like, one of those, like, ho teenage horror films, so they had like the five kids from the film. We all had our eyes rolled back in our head and there's like an institutional-like looking building with flames coming out of the window in the background. You know, it looks like a zombie picture. But then it eventually came out and I think that uh, it's nice when you see that, you know, uh, you know, when a film finally gets some recognition. But you know, it's not why we do it, you know? I mean, it's not why I do it. Right. Um, I would never trade the experience I had when I directed my own film. I would never turn that, you know, even though, you know, did it, did it get, did it have like a huge success? No. Am I enormously proud of it? I am. But more importantly, I have nothing but great memories from that experience, you know. And uh, for me, you know, I, I've always, uh, you know, I think interests are very important, I think, to stay young and to keep your brain and your spirit youthful. And, uh, so as a, a creative person, there's been times I've been frustrated. For example, City of Ghosts was born out of a kind of, you know, a kind of a painful place where I was just disappointed with what I was, what was being presented to me as an actor. So I said, listen, man, it's time to step up and, you know, do your own thing. And, and uh, so, you know, as long as I, um, uh, you know, I have things that I'm interested in doing, then, I, then, I, then I, hopefully I won't lose the plot, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, you got to make a living as an actor, you know, so sometimes I'll go a year without working, I'm waiting for the right thing, and then finally something comes along, and it might not be exactly what I had in mind, but I got to get back to work, I got to do what it is that I do, you know. Well, I hope uh, people go see Factotum when it, when it comes out, I really enjoyed it, and uh, I've seen it once, I plan on seeing it again, and uh, Thanks for being on the show. Great really to be on it. the show, man. It was great talking to you. Right on. Thanks. Yeah.
Great. Coming up a little later in the show, I'll join Heidi May and the rest of the Rollins Band. But first, this season's final installment of Drawing Conclusions. Have you ever once in your life considered, pondered, meditated upon how shitty it would be to be Jesus Christ? <laughs> and don't think at all that I'm trying to put the guy down. I am quite the fan, okay? Never read the book, but I like the story. <laughs> and, well, think about his gig. He's got to forgive and love every person who comes to his door. No one ever walks up to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, yes, Father, I forgive. No, 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 I don't need forgiveness, man. I got two Rolling Stones tickets. I want to know if you want to go. Okay, no one ever walks up to Jesus. Jesus, here's a joint. Really good shit. Oh, man, thank you, brother. No one ever walks up to Jesus. Like, no hot chick. Jesus, woohoo, Jesus. Never happens. It's just, oh, Jesus, I killed five people. You have to forgive me. You have to hug every fucking tro drooling troglodyte hanging outside of Graceland, waiting for him to come back. Oh, Jesus. And he's like, okay, it's okay. I love you. I forgive you. Okay, okay. There you go. Off into the night. Okay. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Jesus is on. And so I wonder if the guy ever gets a break, if there's ever a window in the history of life where there's nobody knocking on his door. Like maybe like every 500 years, there's every once in a while, you know, he hears from a, a director's chair on high. You know, Cut! Jesus, you got three minutes. You can go to your trailer. No one needs you. Really? Three minutes. Yeah, Jesus, you got three minutes. Oh, thank you, brother. God, I gotta take a fucking leak. Oh my God. <gasps> oh, oh. And he's hoping that joint he left in his trailer is still there. And maybe he can catch some news or some kind of TV. Like, oh, fucking hell. Oh, fuck. And he hears, like, incoming serial killer need of forgiveness. Oh, brother. <gasps> I killed eight people, Jesus, you gotta forgive me. Okay, brother, of course I for... No one's around, no one's looking. You motherfucker! Fuck you! I will fucking hate you, motherfuckers! Kill it! How the fuck did that feel? Boom, boom, serial killing, bitch! Bam, bam, bam! Jesus, we're back on! Bam! <laughs> brother, did you fall? It's the end of the season, and I know that nobody likes a breakup, especially when you're the one being dumped. So I've been trying to figure out the best way to let everybody at home down nice and easy with no hurt feelings. Other shows end their seasons with gimmicks like cliffhangers, unannounced cancellations, and ritual suicide. But I know that everybody's emotional attachment to this show is so strong that there's only one way for me to properly say farewell for the season, and that's with a good old-fashioned montage. As the season ends, these are the things I'll never forget. The laughs that made me laugh. The serious talk that made me think seriously. The personal growth I've shared with you all. The love for my fans the fan mail, the creative process, the teamwork, and the kinetic energy of the set that made me want to live to be alive. Does that make you feel better? Yes. It's farewell for the season. But just remember, it's not you, it's me. Now wipe those tears from your eyes. Henry Rollins, 
Sim Kane, Melvin Gibbs, Chris Haskett, and soundman Teo Van Rock, collectively known as the Rollins Band, played their last show together in 1997. They reunited in the spring of 2006 and are presently gearing up for a North American tour in late summer. Here to perform for the first time in public in nine years, this is the Rollins Band playing Volume 4, Uncut. Tell me. 